First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 8. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 8. So, before we go any further, can we just confirm what has been agreed so far, as it's starting to get a little complicated? Certainly. Tell you what, why don't I start to make out the invoice? Should I address it to you personally, or is there a business name you'd like me to use? We trade under the name Ben and Di Enterprises. OK. Now, as you were talking to one of my sales reps to start with, I'm going to put him down as the contact on the invoice. That way, he'll get the commission on this sale, you see. His name was Rowan Laver, is that right? Rather peculiar name, but a lovely man. You almost got it. It's Rome, as in the city. And Laver, L-A-V-E-R. Your order number is 6589B521. You're paying in full, is that right? Yes. OK. Today's the 4th of April, so we'll put a due date of the 10th on there. Now, do you remember your order details? Yes. Uh, first there was the filing cabinets. Of course. For a rate of £15 each. Didn't you order print paper as well? Yes, we're taking 20 glossy photo paper bundles. What's the unit price again? It works out at £20 per bundle and £400 in total. And Rome said we could do a deal on the software packages, isn't that right? Yes. Seeing as you bought five at once, we'll reduce the unit price to £100 from £120, leaving us with a total amount of £500. I needn't remind you that there is an additional fixed charge totalling £40 specifically for the software installation. Of course. So, getting to a total figure then including sales tax, 16% VAT is added on. That gives us £1,160 by my reckoning. By VAT, do you mean sales tax? Isn't that 10%? It's 25% on some products and 10% on others. We work out an aggregate figure and apply it to all goods sold. In this case, it was 16%, as I've mentioned. Fair enough. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 9 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 9 to 10. Listen, I know the due date isn't for a week, but do you mind if I write you out a cheque today? Not at all. You can make it out to me, Michael McCloskey. How do you spell that, then? What, McCloskey? It's capital M, C, capital C, L, O, S, K, E, Y. Got it. And how much should I make it out for, in total? £1,500, please. £1,500? Yes, that's including my consultancy service fees. Oh, I almost forgot about that. Let me make a note here on the cheque. Includes consultancy fees. Now we're almost done. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a talk about au pairs in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. What is an au pair? An au pair is a single girl without any dependents who comes to the UK to learn English and to live as part of an English-speaking family. She is not a domestic servant but may help in the house for up to five hours a day for pocket money. Suitable tasks would be light housework and taking care of children. She should have one day each week completely free and she should be free to attend language classes and religious services if she wishes. Pocket money should be between 15 and 20 pounds per week and she should have her own room. Before she arrives she should have as much information as possible about the home she is going to and what she will be expected to do. She will find it helpful to have a letter from her hostess explaining the arrangements to show the immigration officer when she arrives. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. An au pair must be a single girl aged at least 17 and no older than 27 when she first becomes an au pair. She must be a national of a Western European country which includes Malta, Cyprus and Turkey. The longest a girl may stay in the UK as an au pair is two years. A girl who has been in the UK before as an au pair will be allowed to come to the UK again as an au pair only if the total period is not more than two years. An au pair is not allowed to take a job in this country. The light household duties which are part of the au pair arrangement are not regarded as employment. An au pair who is a national of a country which is not in the Commonwealth or European community EC and who is admitted for longer than six months will normally have to register with the police. This will be shown in her passport. She must take her passport and two passport size photographs to a police station. She will have to pay a fee, about £25. If an au pair wishes to stay longer than the time stamped in her passport, she may apply either by post to Luna House, Croydon or in person at one of the public inquiry offices. If she applies by post, it is a good idea to send any valuable documents by recorded delivery post. She should apply before the time limit on her permitted stay runs out. She must show that the arrangements are still those of an au pair. She may change host families during her time in the UK providing that the new arrangements are also those of an au pair. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear some students discussing an assignment. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Well, Fiona, we certainly have a lot of work to do this weekend.、Mm. I wish now I hadn't spent so much time on my other assignment. Don't say that. You did really well, eighty percent. Yes, but this is different. It's not hard, really. It's just all a bit of a rush. We had loads of time to get the other one right, but this one is all a bit pressured. That's what makes me anxious, despite the preparation we've done. You shouldn't worry. What could go wrong? Look, let's look through what we can do to make sure it's okay. Well, the main difficulty that's bothering me is about defining the terms of reference.、Mm. It's supposed to be about approaches to social welfare, right? Yes, but we're not expected to give a survey of what that means. That's not the point. We're supposed to be comparing the way welfare is approached in collectivist societies and what you might call capitalist societies. So we can concentrate on just that contrast. Yes. The other thing that bothers me is that I'm not really committed to either view. Well, I have strong opinions of my own, but that's not supposed to colour my judgement. How do you mean? Well, what you write for this is supposed to be unbiased. It specifically says that you shouldn't give a personal view. But Professor Green has a personal view. Yes, but that doesn't mean that we have to agree with him, and I don't think we'll do any better if we do. And how long does it have to be? The maximum is four thousand words. What? But that's the maximum. We'll probably end up with about three, but at least two thousand is the minimum. Shouldn't be a problem. Hmm. Okay. Now answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Now, where can we get some information on all this? Well, we could ask Olive over there. Olive, you did this assignment last year, didn't you? Not this one exactly, but something similar. <sighs> the most important thing is to get Professor Green's lectures on the welfare state. Is he good? Oh, very good. Didn't you know he was lecturing? No, no idea. Well, he is. He's at the Beckett Building on Tuesdays. I think he's starting this week, so you'll be able to get the series of six. He deals with the underlying philosophy as well as the economics of it all. It's at ten a.m. I'd go myself, except that I have too much to do. And what about reading? I've got the reading list here. As usual, it has far more titles and references than we can possibly read in the time. I haven't even got a reading list. Where did you get that from, Mike? I got it at the welcome lecture. Oh, I wish I'd gone to that now. What you need above all is his own book called Welfare Economics. All the department know it and follow his approach. Oh, right. Good idea. Perhaps we don't need to go to the lecture if we have his book. No, I really do advise you to go to his lectures as well. Well, what was the full title of his book?、Mm, if I remember rightly, it's called simply Welfare Economics. By Mike Green.、Mm. I've got it. Welfare Economics, Glenfield University Press, two thousand and six. Great. Let me just write that down. Anything else you recommend?、Uh, there's Edward Jones's book,、um, Growing Old in Britain. That's essential reading, but you have to be careful because it's a popular book by a journalist. Well, if it's popular, maybe we'll like it. Who publishes that? That's published by Rutland University Press. In two thousand and five.、Oh, well, that's very useful. I think it's Professor Green for us next. Right. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to an interview. Mr. Brooks, Mark, Jean, and Robert are being interviewed on the subject of friendship. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. I consider friendship to be one of the most important things in life, whatever your status, married or single. I see too many lonely people around. A lot of us get so involved with material values, family problems, keeping up with the Joneses, etc., that we forget the real meaning of friendship. Which is what, according to you? They say a friend in need is a friend indeed, which is partly true. But a real friend should also be able to share your happy moments without feeling jealous. A good friendship is one where you can accept and forgive him, understand mood, and don't feel hurt if a friend doesn't feel like seeing you. Of course, honesty is an essential part of any relationship. We should learn to accept our friends for what they are. As a married man, do you find your friendship is only with other men? Of course not. Both my wife and I have men and women friends. Thank goodness. Although family life is fulfilling, it isn't enough. Both my wife and I get tremendous satisfaction from our friends, married or single, male and female, and we both have our separate friends too. We'd get bored with each other if we had the same friends. You must have a full life. We certainly do, and as I say, our friendship gives us a lot of pleasure. After all, friends should not be people with whom you kill time. Real friendship, in my opinion, is a spiritually developing experience. I've never had a lot of friends. I've never regarded them as particularly important. Perhaps that's because I come from a big family: two brothers and three sisters. And lots of cousins, and that's what's really important in my family. If you really need help, you get it from your family, don't you? Well, at least that's what I've always found. What about you, Jean? To me, friendship, having friends, people I know I can really count on. To me, that's the most important thing in life. It's more important even than love. If you love someone, you can always fall out of love again, and that can lead to a lot of hurt feelings, bitterness, and so on. But a good friend is a friend for life. And what exactly do you mean by a friend? Well, I've already said, someone you know you can count on. I suppose, what I really mean is, let's see, how am I going to put this? It's someone who will help you if you need help. Who will listen to you when you talk about your problems? Someone you can trust. What do you mean by a friend, Robert? Who likes the same things that you do? Who you can argue with and not lose your temper, even if you don't always agree about things. I mean, someone who you don't have to talk to all the time, but can be silent with, perhaps. That's important too.
You can just sit together and not say very much sometimes. Just relax. I don't like people who talk all the time. Are you very good at keeping in touch with your friends if you don't see them regularly? No, not always. I've lived in lots of places, and to be honest, once I move away, I often do drift out of touch with my friends. And I'm not a very good letter writer either. Never have been. But I know that if I saw those friends again, if I ever moved back to the same place, or for some other reasons, we got back into close contact again, I'm sure the friendship would be just as strong as it was before. Several of my friends have moved away, got married, things like that. One of my friends has had a baby recently, and I'll admit, I don't see or hear from her as much as I used to. She lives in another neighborhood, and when I phone her, she always seems busy. But that's an exception. I write a lot of letters to my friends and get a lot of letters from them. I have a friend I went to school with, and ten years ago she emigrated to Canada. But she still writes to me every month, and I write to her just as often. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.